Hello cadets, this is Major Thevenin and we're going to go over chapter 8, Professional Rescuer CPR. In this chapter we're going to recognize shock, resp resp respiratory failure uh, versus respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest. We're going to learn how to manage immediate life uh, threatened injuries again within the scope of the EMR. We're going to learn how to do primary assessments in terms of your patient is conscious or not, uh, the ABCs, identifying what a life threat injury are, and knowing abnormal versus normal vital functions. So let's begin. So doing your cardiopulmonary resuscitation, it consists of your ABCs, circulation, airway, and breathing. Airway and breathing skills may be life-saving for a patient whose heart is still beating, as we discussed in the previous chapter seven. So why do we do CPR? That's what we're going to learn about. To maintain and restore recirculation manually performing cardiac compression, that is our goal until higher level of care has come to the scene and able to transport the patient to the hospital. Approximately 70% of patients in cardiac arrest are stable, are, are in state of ventricular fibrillation. So the anatomy of your circular system is basically the heart and the vessels, correct? So um, the heart, we know it's located in the lungs, it consists of four chambers, two on the right, two on the left. So this is a picture of the heart. It's closed and open, the inside. So we have the heart, we have the uh, upper chambers here and there. You have the right atrium, the left atrium. We have the lower chambers, the uh, right ventricle and the left ventricle. And this is consists of the pumping system to, to the heart, receives from the body, uh, sorry, uh, sends blood to the lungs, receive blood from the lungs, receive blood from the body, and returns blood back to the body. We have the valves here that separates the upper chamber and the lower chambers. That prevents, that prevents backflow into the previous chamber. The arteries are colored here red to, for, to show that they carry oxygenated blood. So the arteries carry blood away from the heart at high pressure. That's why we can feel a pulse. Uh, smaller arteries eventually branch into capillaries, and the sm smaller pipes of the th these are the smaller pipes of the circular system, and the veins, which is they colored it blue or uh, purplish, to show that it carries blood that are low in oxygen back into the heart, to eventually go back to the lungs to get some oxygen and return back. Okay. There are four major areas to check for a pulse. We have the neck called carotid. We have the wrist 
called radial. We have the arm called brachial. We have the upper thigh area called femoral. Blood have, is made of different components. Plasma, red blood cells, that's the cell that carries oxygen from the lung, etc. White blood cells, that's uh, the, the immune system part of, the, of the, the blood, you know, kills bacteria and foreign diseases uh, causing organism. We have platelets that allows, you know, um, clotting, the clotting process. If you cut yourself, platelets comes or to the area and s stops the bleeding. Uh, this is just a breakdown of if you go under a microscope and you would see the layering of the uh, the blood. So, what is cardiac arrest? It's when basically your heart stops, right? There's no blood that is pumping to or from the heart to the blood vessels or into the body. So without a supply of blood, the cells begin to die. And we've mentioned the most uh, sensitive organs that are lack that are very sensitive to lack of oxygen are the, the heart and the brain. Brain damage begins within four to six minutes and it becomes irreversible. Causes of cardiac arrest, many, many causes, if you can read through that list right there. <laughs> Feel free to free uh, pause if you need to review and read or jot down notes. A patient who has experienced cardiac arrest is unconscious and is not breathing. You cannot feel a pulse and the patient looks dead. All right? They start they look pale or grayish. You look at the four areas, you look at you check a pulse and the uh, um, the carotid near the neck and there's you don't feel anything. It's silence. Regardless of the cause, the initial treatment for this is the same. Providing CPR. Start start, start pumping on the chest. CPR requires circulation, airway, and breathing skills. Airway and breathing skills determine whether the airway is open, right? We do the head tilt, the head tilt chin lift or the jaw thrust maneuver. Determine, um, you know, at this time, this, you see if the patient is breathing or not. If they're not breathing, then you do the rescue breathing for them. Circulation is, again, is checking the pulse. If there's no pulse, that's where you start doing CPR, meaning compression, on the chest. As soon as you recognize that their patient is un unconscious, no pulse, not breathing, do not delay, it's immediate, C start CPR immediately. So we know that there is a chain of survival. You you recognize that patient is, is going into has gone into cardiac arrest so you activate the emergency response system and you start performing CPR if you have an AED you put it on them to see if they have a a rhythm that's able to be defibrillated EMS, paramedic, comes on the scene. ALS begins in terms of IV, medication, etc. When do you start CPR? CPR should be started on all non-breathing, pulseless patient unless you see a DNR somewhere on the, on the body or paperwork. Signs of death. When do you not do CPR? Decapitation. You can see the as the head is separated from the rest of the body. Rigor mortis, meaning stiffening of the muscle, means that the patient, this person has been dead for a while. Um, Decomposition. Decomp Position actual the actual flesh decays, decaying, uh, dependent lividity, 
red or purplish color occurs on the parts of the patient that is closest to the ground, you know, where gravity is working there. When do you stop CPR? It's very tricky as an EMR, so take note this. Take note. Effective spontaneous circulation and ventilation are restored. You know, when the patient is back to life, you feel a pulse, patient is breathing, patient is moving by themselves. Uh, resuscitation efforts are transferred to another trained person. All right, so when a paramedic EMS comes on the scene, uh, other time a CPR is stopped is when the physician has ordered you to stop. The patient is transferred to properly trained EMS personnel. Reliable criteria for death are recognized. Again, you as an EMR, you do not make the the uh, the call. You are too exhausted to continue resuscitation. Environmental hazard endanger your safety, or continued resuscitation will place the lives of others at risk. In an unresponsive patient, scan the chest quickly for signs of breathing and check for a pulse. To check for a pulse for an infant, you would want to check the brachial area. To do chest compression for an infant, you would use the two-finger method. For a child, you would check for uh, in the carotid, which is near the neck, and you would begin chest compression. In small children, place the heel of one hand in the center of the chest in between the nipple and you begin compressing on the chest. For lar larger children and adults, you would use a two-hand two method. The run, one re rescuer adult CPR, we're gonna go through the uh, drill when we meet together. You must deliver chest compression and rescue breathing at a ratio of 30 to two. Very important to remember uh, those parameters. 30 to two, if you're by yourself performing CPR, meaning you press, compress, on the chest 30 times and you do two rescue breathing and you continue. If there are two EMR at the scene or two folks, to avoid fatigue you would alternate every five cycles, meaning that you have done 30 to two, 30 to two ratios five times. Switching position should be accomplished as, so, as smoothly and quickly as possible to limit the to limit the disruption for compression. Okay, so this will be less than ten seconds to switch. For an infant, this will compression compress the chest thirty times with your fingertips at the rate of hundred to one twenty compressions per minute, and you give two rescue breaths. If there are two rescuers uh, infant CPR, doing infant CPR, you use the two thumb method um, technique, compressing over the sternum at a rate of 100. The rate does not change, but the uh, compression to ventilation changes. So if there's two rescuers, it's 15 to two. If there's one rescuer, it is 30 to two. Pay attention to that, very important. For a child, The steps for a child CPR are essentially the same as an adult. The rate remains the same. And you continue, you continue to do this and alternating if there's two of you or more every two minutes or five cycles of CPR has been done. Sign of effective CPR. The second rescuer feels a carotid pulse. The, the patient skin color improves. You see chest rise, meaning patient is breathing or rises during ventilation. 
Compressions and mutilations are delivered at the appropriate rate and depth. There are complications, of course. Broken ribs. But that should not stop you from continuing CPR. If you hear cracking sounds, check and correct your hand position, but continue CPR. Gastric dist distension occurs when too much air is blown too fast and too forcefully into the stomach. That's why the rate of two is very important. Regurgitation, meaning vomiting. Again, is because due to um, increase air into the stomach. And how do you prevent that? Again, is controlling the ventilation for your patient. If there's a suction available, use it. Complication of that is that, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the vomiting, uh, the vomitus can go into the lung, causes further damage. As soon as that's been cleared, you re regain um, rescue breathing. Sometimes you're the first person on the scene and you would have to move the patient to a better area to perform adequate CPR. If there's not enough space around the patient, you quickly have to move them. Again, time is essential. These things must be done quickly. More than 70% of all outside, out of hospital cardiac arrest patients have an irregular heartbeat, and most common is ventricular fibril fibrillation. So VFib is a rapid, disorganized, and ineffective vibration of the heart. All right? The electric shock applied to the heart will stop this disorganized beating of the heart and it would reorganize the vibration into effective heartbeats. And that's where your AED comes in handy. An increasing number of EMS systems are equipped with e uh, equipping, sorry, increasing number of EMS systems are equ equipping EMRs with AEDs. And AEDs are found also in all public places. These machines ident identified ventricular fibrillation or VFib and advised the rescuer to deliver a shock if needed. EMRs should successfully complete a CPR course, so you all, we all need to be BLS certified. Regularly update their skills by completing recognized recertification courses and continue to practice, practice, practice. Legal implication of CPR. Advanced directives are living and living wills are legal documents that specify the patient's wishes regarding specif uh, specified medical procedures. So are basically legal papers saying if the patient wants you to be compressing on their hearts or breathing for them. This is called DNR. CPR should be started on all patients unless signs of obvious death are present, correct? If a patient has an advanced directive, tells you, you know, what they want to be done to their body, the physician at the hospital will determine whether you should stop CPR or not. But never hesitate to start CPR on a pulseless, non-breathing patient. Without your help, the patient will die. Remember that. Abandonment. Discontinuing CPR without the order of a licensed physician or without turning the patient over to someone who is at least as qualified as you are. Cardiac arrest occurs when the heart stops, right? The chain of survival is recognizing, activating. Immediate high-quality CPR must be started. Rapid defibrillation if the AED is present. 
uh, basic advanced EMS, ALS, and post-arrest care. Basic life supports followed basically the same steps for adults, children, and infants. Check for resp responsiveness, check to see if they're circulation, check to see if they're breathing, and open the airway. At any point, intervene at any point where the patient airway is obstructed. The patient is the patient's not breathing or the patient has no circulation. The single most important cardiac arrest survival factor in, is early defibrillation. The indication for using a AED are that the patient is unresponsive, not breathing, and pulseless. Once turned on and attached, once turned on and attached to the patient's bare chest, the AED will analyze the heart rhythm and will tell you whether to shock it or not. All right, this was the summary of chapter eight. Let's do some review questions. A patient who is in cardiac arrest, what do you think? Cardiac arrest meaning heart is not pumping and not breathe and they're not breathing. So it's B. Majority of the of out of hospital cardiac arrest patients have an irregular heart electrical rhythm called V fib. How is this rhythm char characterized? Do you remember? One, we know it's rapid, it's disorganized, and ineffective. So it's A. Which of the following is not a sign of effective CPR? It's all about the compression, right? So we need to do which is wrong. Basically, compression are delivered at a rate of 50 per minute. We need to be 100 to 120 compressions per minute. And thank you very much for going through chapter eight.